is Whitney Knitter, and if you're unfamiliar with me, I run an electronics tutorial blog called Dittronics, where I namely focus on FPGA tutorials. And today, I've partnered with Avnet to define and demonstrate one of the newer form factors of FPGA boards that you've probably been hearing about as of late. And that is the SOM, or System on Module. SOMs have become popular recently due to the high demand for short development cycles. A system on module is defined as any board level circuit that contains all of the functionality of an entire system on a single module. The system in this case is being defined as an embedded system. And as a quick reminder, an embedded system is defined as a computer system that contains a processor, memory, and I.O. peripherals with a dedicated functionality in a larger system. Now, you're probably wondering, Whitney, what differentiates a SOM from a single board computer? It sounds pretty similar by definition at this point. A single board computer is something that is a very general use. A SOM, on the other hand, has a very dedicated functionality within a larger system. Typically, these functionalities are more timing and speed sensitive since SOMs are mostly FPGA based or system on a chip based, which system on a chip is differentiated from system on module because system on a chip is all of the peripherals and system contained within a single silicon. A SOM is an actual PCB containing all of this circuitry. We'll start looking at those when we browse through Abnet's catalog of SOMs and you'll kind of get the idea. Now to briefly cover it, SOMs typically consist of some sort of microcontroller, microprocessor, or DSP core as its brain, which can also be an FPGA, memory such as DDR, spy flash, anything of that sort, peripheral IOs, all of the power conditioning circuitry that is required. So SOMs typically don't need any extra power conditioning circuitry on their carrier boards that they're being connected to. Now that I've defined what a SOM is, let's dive into and discuss why you would choose a SOM for your next project versus a fully populated FPGA development board. The nice thing about SOMs is that they compartmentalize and separate your choice between the actual brains, which is the FPGA chip with its memory and power conditioning circuitry, from the peripherals on the board, such as USB, UART, PMODs, FMC, basically any peripheral you can think of. So when you have your SOM with your, containing your FPGA and you place it on your carrier with the rest of your peripherals, you now have the freedom to say as your project evolves or you make different changes, or even if you have a derivative type project that you want to take your base design to, you can simply take the SOM off of its carrier board, switch it to another carrier board with the same connector footprint, and continue on with that project, maintaining all of your base design files for say, booting the FPGA chip, its common functionality needed, such as the UR interface or whatever your proprietary code is that is common amongst all of your projects. The other nice thing about compartmentalizing your brains or your FPGA chip from your peripherals is that it can cut down your development time significantly. If you start with a known good SOM baseboard, which I should also mention when I say baseboard, I am referring to the actual SOM board with the FPGA chip on it, and then carrier board is what it's connecting to with all of your peripherals on it. When you're starting with a known good baseboard that you've purchased off the shelf from somewhere like Avnet, you can skip the part of having to prove in that the FPGA works, that the memory works, that the power and conditioning circuitry works. That's all guaranteed for you essentially. And you can then just focus on the carrier board. If you're laying that out brand new, or if you're proving in a peripheral interface that's on that board, you can really just focus on getting that to work to start with. And most of the time, at least from personal experience, I've found that unless I have some weird condition where the SOM baseboard doesn't meet super low power requirements or a footprint requirement or shock and vibe requirements, meaning I can't have any connectors, everything needs to be on one PCB, I can typically stick with my SOM baseboard and then simply de design and lay out my own carrier board once I've proved in my project on say an off the shelf carrier board. So not needing to repurchase parts such as the FPGA chip, because especially in today's silicon shortage, if I don't need to repurchase, say, my zinc processing chip once on an FPGA development board and then again standalone to put on my own PCB, 
that's extremely helpful from a time, cost, and development perspective. So now that we have an idea of why we would choose a SOM and what benefits they have, let's scroll through Avnet's catalog together to see their different offerings of SOM baseboards, along with their corresponding carrier boards, of course. So Avnet offers a good range of SOM baseboards with corresponding carrier boards for each of those SOMs. So starting on Avnet's landing page for SOMs here, you can scroll through and read about some of the benefits that I talked through. And then there's this table here that outlines the FPGA chips that each of the SOM baseboards is modeled around. Furthermore, they've got this selector guide PDF that's really handy, which I've already downloaded and that's what we're gonna scroll through here. We can take a look and see all the different SOMs we have to choose from here. We've got the Korea, the Micro Z, Pico Z, a couple different ultra board selections, and then a series of RFSOC based SOMs. The first thing that's important to select for your SOM baseboard is the type of FPGA chip that you want on it. Does that FPGA have enough programmable logic in it, enough user IO, the right type of peripheral interfaces? These are all considerations you wanna have in mind. This first table that we look at in the SOM brochure is gonna kinda of help you differentiate that and then tell you which baseboard contains the right type of FPGA chip for you. And then we've got the RFSOCs broken out into their own table since they're pretty different from the Zinc Ultra Scale and 7000 boards of the rest of the baseboards. So the first board that we're looking at is the Korea KV260. Now the Korea KV260 constitutes both the Korea K26 SOM baseboard and then the actual carrier board that it's on for that kit. So that carrier board you can see contains ethernet, USB, HDMI. Now the Korea K26 board is really targeted towards computer vision and AI type applications. So unless that's your target, you can probably choose a little bit cheaper of a SOM chip. And as you can see, this is the Korea K26 SOM that's underneath the red heat sink here on the Korea KV260 kit. Up next is the Micro Z, which I like because it's one of the few SOM baseboards that can be used standalone and doesn't necessarily need the carrier board to be able to connect to peripheral interfaces such as the UART. The Micro Z is also one of the more cost-effective SOM baseboards along with their carrier boards. So as you can see, the Micro Z comes in a few different versions with different size zinc chips on it as well as different temperature grades. So moving on to the Micro Z accessories, aka the different carrier cards, you can see how the peripherals change between each of the carrier boards to fit your needs. For instance, this first IO carrier card is all about just getting as much IO out in the form of PMODs as it possibly can. The next carrier card is an FMC based carrier card. And then finally, we've got our Arduino header board here. Up next, we have the Pico Z, which like the Micro Z is also Zinc 7000 based, but I would argue is more flexible in its offering of SOM baseboards as it has the most wide variety of different Zinc chips offered for it. So, taking a look at all the different parts we have, we have everything from a 7010 to a 7015, 7020, and even a 7030 zinc chip that you can choose from. Looks like there's only one carrier card for the Pico Z from Avnet specifically. However, the Pico Z has a pretty easy footprint for its connection between itself as the baseboard to a carrier board. So it would be, this would be an ideal board to choose for laying out your own carrier board. Next, we have the first of the two Ultra Z SOMs from Avnet. The Ultra Z SOMs are ideal because they are MPSOC based instead of Zinc 7000 based. So if you need that extra processing power, the Ultra Zs are gonna be your more ideal choice. The other thing that I like about the Ultra Z EG is that it's also on the lower cost spectrum for an MPSOC based development board as well. So if you need that extra processing power, but you're also keen, trying to keep the price lower, I would definitely recommend the Ultra Z EG part. For Ultra Z EG accessories or different carrier cards, there's again, an IO type carrier card that's focused on getting as much IO out and available to the user as possible and a PCIe based carrier card that also has an FMC connector. So if your application is a lot of high speed IO, this is gonna be the carrier card you'll wanna select for your Ultra Z baseboard. The other Ultra Z SOM that we have is the Ultra Z EV. Now the thing that makes the Ultra Z EV stand out from the Ultra Z EG is that it contains the Xilinx VCU. 
which makes it more ideal for video processing type applications, which the Xilinx VCU is the Xilinx video control unit. So if you have something like high-speed video, a security camera type project, I would choose the Ultra Z EV. But if your security camera project also needs some sort of computer vision or AI type application layer to it, then I'd kick you back to the Krea K26 board. So just kind of some of the mindset there of how I would choose different SOMs when I have kind of a little bit overlapping type applications. <laughs> Small ran over. So looking at the Ultra Z EV accessories, again, we only have the one carrier card. However, it's pretty well equipped with most peripherals that you would need with an MPSOC based development project. So you've got all of your IO pulled out, some gigabit transceivers, uh, micro headers. It's a pretty solid uh, carrier card and you can also purchase the SOM and the carrier card as a starter kit together. And then continuing to scroll through the brochure, it's got some of the carrier boards regrouped together based upon their peripherals. So as you can see, these are FMC based carrier cards, which if you're starting with your peripherals and working backwards, you can see which SOM offers FMC based carrier cards. And then finally, we have the different RFSOC modules you can choose from, which like I mentioned, there's four different RFSOC parts. Now, I'm not gonna really dive into the RFSOCs in this particular video as they're pretty specialized and probably need a whole video on themselves to really explain the benefits of why you would choose them, what projects they'd need, and how to differentiate between the different parts. So now that we've gone through the brochure, I'm going to transition over and we're going to do a demo project showing you how to take a single SOM and swap out different carrier cards within the same Vivado and Vitus project. So let's pop over to Linux. So I have the MicroZ SOM here with two of the different carrier boards that you can purchase with it. The first of which is the Arduino header carrier board, and then the second of which is the FMC based carrier board. And I'm gonna do a simple blink LED project on both of the carrier boards in a single Vivado Vitus project. That way you can see how you can save time sticking with the same SOM baseboard and swapping out carrier boards when you need to change peripherals. So taking a look, I went ahead and threw together a simple uh, block diagram here in Vivado, which is simply the zinc processing system with an Axie GPIO. This Axie GPIO, like I said, super simple. It's just one output bit because we're just blinking a single LED. And then I went ahead and created a top level file. So I've got Arduino carrier top, which as you can imagine goes with my Arduino carrier board here. So I I've got all of my Arduino header pins here. And then my first of my digital output Arduino header pins, I'm simply pulling through to my LED pin from my block design right here. So I've also created my Arduino carrier pin out here, which I've got all of my different Arduino header pins mapped out here. And here's our digital output pin that we're using right here, going to package pin W20 on the zinc chip. So I've already created a bit stream for this and exported it and in our Vitus project. So I've created our Arduino carrier platform project and then our actual application project that goes with it. As you can see here, I've got my blinking LED status for it here. So let's do a quick debug run here and just see it in action real quick because who doesn't like watching an LED blink? And then and there we go. So we are fully up and running on the Arduino header carrier board right now with our blinking LED. You can kind of see where I've shoved in my little breadboard here because I couldn't find any of my actual Arduino shields that had just my single LED on it. So now I'm going to swap over to my FMC carrier board, which happens to have some LEDs built onto it. And we're gonna flash one of these LEDs and all we're gonna change is the top level file in Vivado and the constraints file. Once we've done that, we'll come back into Vitus and we'll create an application just for this guy. And I'll show you how fast that we'll be up and running on this guy 
starting from a blinking LED on this other carrier board. So let's kill this debug run. Gonna disconnect power. Switch back over to Vivado carefully. Oh, the only thing that makes me sweat a little bit with SOM baseboards and carrier boards and the whole SOM setup is I hate pulling the SOM baseboards off because I feel like I'm flexing the carrier boards. I feel like one of these days my klutzy self is going to break something, but that's just me. So this is the perfect time to take a look at on your SOM baseboards, you'll typically have some sort of high density, low profile connector. And that connector will be shared amongst all of your different carrier boards. So taking a look at the difference between your Arduino header board and your FMC carrier board. Now, a lot of SOMs will have their connectors between their baseboards and their carrier boards keyed such that you definitely can't plug them in the wrong way. Some might not. With the MicroZ in particular, it looks like these. Can you plug these in backwards? I've never looked at these close enough. I, I still double check and make sure that I match the reference designators between the two. So JX1 on my baseboard and JX1 on my carrier board. This is really awkward trying to hold this up so that you can see what I'm doing. There we go, get that clicked in. And another pro tip, if you have any weird things going on with your design, something's not programming, maybe your LED's not flashing on your carrier board, that's your first point of failure to check is just give yourself another little squeeze here between your carrier and your baseboard to make sure that you fully got everything seated because that's another common mistake of my own is I'll think I'll have it fully seated and it's not. In fact, I was mad at myself earlier. Why can't I get a simple LED to blink? Well, I didn't have it fully seated. I'll go ahead and plug back in our UART port to the micro Z. So now that we've got the baseboard connected to our carrier board, another thing to watch out for is a lot of the times the carrier boards will need a separate form of input power, even if your baseboard can be powered off the JTAG interface connected to your computer. The FMC board is one of those uh, boards, as well as what my Arduino header board was, which is what this white cable was before. I have my Xilinx 12 volt adapter here. We'll just plug that in here. So we're all set up hardware wise here on our other carrier board. So jumping back over to Vivado here, I went ahead and I've created the files, but we're gonna switch over to target the FMC file. So I'm going to re-enable my top file and my constraints file, which while my hierarchy is re-updating, let's open up these and take a look. So you can see my FMC carrier top file again, just had looks identical to my Arduino carrier top, except for now I don't, instead of having my Arduino header pins here, I've got a few of the FMC carrier uh, pins here. So I don't have all of the FMC pins in my top file here. I do have them in my constraints file, which I will attach. I have them commented out though, just since I'm not using the FMC connector in this particular demo, I went ahead and commented them out. So my FMC carrier top, again, I've got my block design with my LED zero pulled through, connected to my LED zero output pin here, which is actually native to the carrier board. And then I've got LED zero, which now is actually going to package pin R19 instead of W20 of the zinc chip. So I'm going to right click on the FMC carrier top file and say set as top, I'm going to on the FMC carrier pinout, right click and say set as target constraints file. And then I'm going to disable my Arduino carrier top and my Arduino pinout file. And I went ahead and already generated this bit stream so we don't have to wait. The nice thing when you create a new top file when you go to export the hardware, you can export two different hardware platforms from Vivado. So as you can see, I've generated a bitstream for both the Arduino carrier and the FMC carrier and exported those hardware platforms. 
So they're actually two separate ones. Meaning when I come over into Vitus, so instead of having to swap out the hardware platform in my existing platform project here in Vitus, I can simply create a new platform project specifically for the FMC carrier bitstream. So I'm gonna name this one FMC carrier platform. Oh, interrupted there. Thank you for letting me know, Vivado. So I'm gonna name this FMC carrier platform and click next and browse to my FMC carrier top hardware platform I've got here. And then click finish. And while that's generating, just as a quick side note, if you don't already know, to export the hardware platform from Vivado, all you come do is come to file, export hardware, I'm gonna click next, make sure you select include bitstream, and then you'll see this is where it automatically wants to name it whatever your top file is and your location. Um, I'm gonna click cancel since I already have it exported there. So now we've got our new carrier platform project for the FMC versus our Arduino one. And we're just gonna give this a quick build. It shows as out of date as soon as you create it just because it's never been built before. So there's no output files, which triggers it to show as out of date. And then once we have that built, we can come up and select new application project. And you can see we've got our two different ones here now. We're gonna select FMC carrier platform because that's what this application project's gonna be for. Click next. I'm gonna name this one FMC Carrier App. Next, next. And then we're just gonna use the Hello World template since we're just blinking an LED. Give that a minute to generate. So as you can see now, we've got our two different applications for our different carrier boards, different platforms. And then I'm gonna come to source. I've got my Hello World C for my FMC carrier app. Let me close a few of these other things here, clear up the screen. And the nice thing is, since I'm using the same Axie GPIO block in the block diagram, I can simply copy everything from the Hello World C in my Arduino carrier app and paste it over top the default code here in my FMC carrier app. Let's save and control B to build that real quick. So the nice thing is now that we're in Vitus, we can have separate platform projects, we can have separate application projects, and there's no need to go back to Vivado to tweak anything and switch back and forth between the different top files or constraints files until I actually need to make a hardware change to the design such as to add more peripherals from the carrier board or if I actually need a functional change in the core design on the baseboard. Basically from here, I cannot touch Vivado. I can stay in Vitus and simply swap out carrier boards and I can simply do a debug run from whichever application matches my carrier board since the platform projects per application contain the bitstream unique to each carrier board. So once we launch a debug run, it automatically comes in and sets a breakpoint as soon as it enters main. And we can now connect to our serial terminal. Okay, go ahead and clear it and then hit run. So as you can see, we've now got the LED zero blinking on our FMC carrier board, exactly like we had it blinking on our Arduino header carrier board. So hopefully this demonstrated the ease of using the same SOM baseboard and swapping out your carrier boards when you have a peripheral need change. I particularly like this so that I can keep everything in one place. That's just how my brain works. I like keeping everything together. So being able to stick within the same Vivado project when I have similar core design needs that's gonna live on the SOM baseboard and being able to stick within the same Vitus workspace and simply swap out applications that makes my organization needs very happy. 
So thanks for tuning in and learning a little bit more about Psalms. Hopefully this demo was helpful for you to see how to speed up your own development cycles. And if you have any more questions about Avnet Psalms, take a look at their website. They have a really great landing page for helping you through your selection process. See you later.